گل everybody. We are so glad that you are all joining us today. My name is Sarah Bunin Benor, and I am the founding director of the Jewish Language Project at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. And now I'm going to share my screen so that you can learn a little bit more about what we do and what we're going to do at our event today. The mission of the Jewish Language Project is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And the most urgent task of all of this is to document endangered languages, because most of the long-standing languages that Jews have spoken for many years are now endangered. And we're working with our several partner organizations through the Jewish Language Consortium to do this important work of documentation. In particular, we're focusing on Iranian languages because these are among the most endangered of the languages and the least researched of the many Jewish languages. And so here are some of the partners that we've been working with to document endangered Iranian Jewish languages. And here you can see the uh, wonderful volunteers that are 
working to do this important work of documentation. And I'd like to thank Haida Herbert Ainechi, Jacob Codner, Noah Kalu, Alan Niku, Michael Zargari, Abby Graham, Sam Miller, Ross Perlin, and Habib Borgian for all of their excellent work to record speakers and transcribe and translate the interviews and songs that have been recorded. And so far we have 21 videos and three of them are transcribed and translated. And we're hoping to finish this work. Here you can see the, the uh, languages that we've recorded, Judeo Hamadani, Kashani, Isfahani, Borujerdi, Nahavandi, Kermani, Shirazi, Tuisarkani, Yazdi, and Lishan Didan. And we need your help though to do this important work. We have raised 34% uh, of our goal and there's only 14 days remaining in our fundraiser. So we urge you to donate today and at, when you do, you can indicate your language priority. Right now, Judeo Isfahani and Hamadani have many people who have expressed interest in using those languages as a priority, and you can express the language that you feel is your priority. Um, another important component of this work is raising awareness about these languages. And we do this at the Jewish Language Project by posting fun facts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and videos on YouTube, and by uh, having events like these. We have had events on Jewish English, Ladino, Bukharian, Judeo-Arabic, Sephardic Jewish Papiamentu, and more. And as you know, this series is about the languages of the Jews of Iran. And many of you have joined us for uh, the previous three events in the series on historical and linguistic overview of Jewish languages in Iran, various median languages spoken by Jews like Judeo Hamadani, Isfahani, and Yazdi, and Jewish Neo-Aramaic in the Kurdish region of Iran. And today's event is about Judeo-Persian in the 20th century, new research. And here's the outline for today. Dr. Daniela Farah will explain why Jews in Iran shifted from these many other languages to standard Persian. Dr. Habib Borgian and Ibrahim Shafi'i will present personal documents written in Persian in Hebrew letters. And then Alan Niku will discuss the distinctive Tehran Jewish dialect of Persian based on his recordings and fieldwork. And Cantor Jacqueline Rafi'i will present Passover Psalms translated into Judeo-Persian and recorded by her grandfather in Tehran in 1971. Only a partial recording of today's event will be posted online. In particular, the section by Dr. Borgian and Ibrahim will not be posted online. At any time, you can write your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I hope you enjoy the uh, event today. So first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Daniela Farah. Dr. Farah is a postdoctoral fellow in Jewish studies at Rice University. She received her PhD from Stanford last year and she has received several honors, including a Salo Baron New Voices in Jewish Studies Award and a Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture grant. Her scholarship lies at the intersection of modern Jewish history, education history, Middle Eastern history, and transnational studies focusing on Jewish Muslim relations, national belonging, and Jewish identity formation in modern Iran and Turkey. And I've invited her today because I attended a presentation that she did uh, about um, Jewish education in Iran. And I realized that there are a lot of overlaps between that and the topic of today, which is why Jews shifted from Judeo Shirazi and Judeo Yazdi and other languages to more standard Persian. And I realized that uh, Dr. Farah's research has a lot to tell us about that. So. Daniela Farah, please tell us what's going on here. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen and then I will begin. Uh, does that look good? Yes. Great. Okay. Well, first, I want to start by uh, thanking Sarah and Hannah for inviting me um, to participate in this wonderful panel today. Um, so 
I feel like a bit of an interloper here because I haven't actually studied Judeo-Persian, but my scholarship on Jews and education in Iran, um, it does examine the uh, educational reforms that ended up impacting whether directly or indirectly the Jews decreasing use of Judeo-Persian and then their shift to modern Persian. So I'll use these few minutes to offer some historical context on the Pahlavi Shah's nationalization of education, and I'll discuss how educational reforms ended up impacting language use. So I'll first offer some background to the educational reforms under the Pahlavi um, Shahs. And as a reminder, and as I have on this slide, the um, dynasty reigned from 1925 to 1979. So I'm going to start with an important quote by the historian Abbas Amonat. So he writes, more than the army, economy, or infrastructure, the growth of public education shaped Pahlavi society and its nationalist culture, end quote. And I'd have to wholeheartedly agree with this statement. Education was central to the nationalist projects of Reza Shah and his son, Muhammad Reza Shah. The nationalist rhetoric of these two monarchs stressed the glories of Iran's pre-Islamic culture and history. It aimed to homogenize an ethnically and linguistically heterogeneous population. And significantly for education, it used the Persian language as a means to cultivate national support. In 1921, General Reza Khan, commander of the Persian Cossack Brigade, took control of Tehran through a military coup, leading to the overthrow of the Qajar dynasty. Reza Khan was declared Reza Shah upon being crowned a king of the Pahlavi dynasty in 1925. Scholar David Menashri, who um, spent a few years in Iran in the 1970s, argues that Reza Shah's um, envisioned education as the most powerful force for Iran's cohesion as a nation, and he used it to bring all Iranian citizens under his chief authority. With his rise to power, all areas of education fell under the state's purview. The government established the Minis uh, Department of Public Education within the Ministry of Education, and starting in 1934, it became the sole institution responsible for supervising all levels of education. And I just want to pause here to note that, um, of course, one major aim of the Pahlavi dynasty under Reza Shah was um, centralizing things. And so not only was he central, uh, education and linguistic centralization were also parts of his nationalistic rhetoric. So a year later in 1935, Reza Shah, inspired by Kemal Ataturk's language reforms in Turkey, established a language academy tasked with implementing language reform in Iran. This academy called Farhangistan aimed to purify the Persian language of its Arabic loanwords, among other things. Although the language reforms in Iran were largely unsuccessful in getting rid of these Arabic loan words, it's undeniable that the Shah was successful in elevating modern standard Persian to a superior status within Iranian society. But that doesn't mean people immediately turned to speaking Persian as a first language. And in fact, sw large swaths of the Iranian population today don't speak Persian as a mother tongue, especially ethnic minority groups. Now I'll focus more concretely on the nationalization of education in Iran and its impacts. In the 1920s, the Ministry of Education's policies led to the creation of a fixed program of education um, in which all elementary and secondary schools in Iran were required to follow the state curriculum. Under Reza Shah's rule, the state published a new set of textbooks in Persian to be used in every grade that were designed to meet the needs of the state. So what do I mean by meeting the needs of the state? Well, for example, one element of Reza Shah's nationalistic project was eradicating the linguistic diversity in Iran. Um, and so one way he aimed to curtail this diversity was through a large scale project of standardizing the Persian language. Therefore, the textbooks un instituted under his reign emphasize knowledge of modern Persian, and the state urged its teachers to refrain from using a local dialect in class. Muhammad Reza Shah, who's featured in this image here, um, who became king of Iran in 1941 after his father's forced abdication, also argued that education was critical for developing national consciousness and preserving national unity. 
He therefore dictated that all Iranian children should have similar schooling, a knowledge of Iran's history and cultural heritage, and should be taught exclusively in Persian. And again, I hope I'm not being too repetitive, but this linguistic element is vital because at the time, at most half of the entire population spoke Persian as a first language. So the imposition of Persian in schools under the Pahlavi um, dynasty impacted a large percentage of the population, including ethnic and religious minority groups um, who didn't speak Persian as a first language. But it's important to note that the process of educational nationalism that I'm talking about in the context of Iran was not unique. Um, indeed, the nationalization of education, which is a part of the broader um, nation building project, was a transnational phenomenon that occurred in many countries, including Turkey and France. The nationalization of education in Iran greatly impacted foreign and religious minority schools, which included Baha'i, Zoroastrian, Armenian, Jewish, and Christian missionary schools. By the end of the 1920s, these schools found themselves in a highly precarious place. So in general, between 1927 and 1939, the Ministry of Education instituted a uniform system of textbooks, exams, and curricula, and all foreign schools were required to institute the state program of education in every grade. More specifically, a 1927 decree dictated that all schools carrying foreign names were required to adopt Persian ones, and a 1928 decree required all foreign schools in Iran to implement Persian or modern Persian as the primary language of instruction. And again, this was a big deal because in a number of minority and foreign schools, Persian had not been the main language of instruction. And I'll go on to talk about the alliance, but um, for example, in the Christian missionary schools in Iran that were established by the American Protestants, and then even in Baha'i schools, uh, English was actually the primary language of instruction. So you might imagine how this implementation of Persian as the main language of instruction could be very devastating or at least challenging to these schools. So the Alliance Israelite Universal schools in Iran are a great case study for what happens to language use after education is nationalized. I'm sure many of you know about the Alliance, but I'm just going to offer a really brief historical background. So the Alliance is a Franco-Jewish philanthropy founded in Paris in 1860, and it went on to build dozens of Jewish schools in Iran starting in 1898. They aimed to civilize North African and Middle Eastern Jews whom they problematically viewed as backwards and superstitious, specifically through um, French education. After education in Iran was nationalized, uh, the state sent non-Jewish teachers to teach um, general subjects in Alian schools, and every Alian school was required to have one Muslim principal. And so after education was nationalized, the Alliance was forced to curtail the cornerstone of their educational work, which is the teaching of French. And I can't emphasize how enough how important French, the language, as well as a French orientation was in Alliance schools. So prior to the nationalization, the main language of instruction was French in all Alliance schools in Iran. But afterwards, with Persian becoming the main language of instruction in most Iranian schools, French was relegated to the status of a foreign language and could only be taught for a few hours per week. The Alliance didn't take well to the Persian Persianization of its schools. In many letters and reports, Alliance teachers and directors in Iran complained that they had to reduce the hours of French and that the Ministry of Education subjected them to frequent and often intrusive inspections. However, they had no choice but to acquiesce to the state's strong nationalizing hand. Over time, the main language of instruction in Alliance schools became Persian, and eventually this was the main language that students in its schools started using. And by the way, before I conclude, I've done extensive archival research um, as well as oral histories pertaining to Alliance schooling in Iran. So if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to extrapolate in the Q&A. So I plan to dedicate future research to studying how this transition from French language instruction to Persian language instruction in Alliance schools looked on the ground, as well as the larger process through which nationalization of education facilitated the Jews' adoption of modern Persian, because there's still a lot of research that needs to be done on these subjects. 
But through my extensive research on Jewish schools in Iran, and this includes Alliance, but other Jewish schools as well, I have concluded that the implementation of Persian language instruction in Jewish schools really did help Jews adopt Persian as a primary spoken language. Ultimately, I believe that the Jews' grasp of modern Persian, which we really begin to see in the mid 20th century, especially in Tehran, was one element that helped Jews integrate into the many spheres of Iranian life. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Farah, thank you so much. That was excellent and really gave us an understanding of why most Iranian Jews today do not actually speak these longstanding languages like Judeo Shirazi and Judeo Kashani and Judeo Isfahani. And in fact, most Iranian Jews haven't even heard of these languages. Some of them are spoken by their grandparents or their great grandparents, but now we understand why in the mid 20th century, these languages really became um, stigmatized as the standard Persian became the the main language of schooling and therefore of prestige. Mm -hmm. um, and now I uh, will we'll have time later for questions, um, but uh, I um, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. If you have questions, then please do put uh, them in the Q&A function. And now I am pleased to introduce Alan Niku. Some of you remember Alan from our previous session and uh, and uh, he is a filmmaker, a writer, and a scholar of Mizrahi culture from San Luis Obispo, California. A native speaker of Persian, he spends his time learning related Jewish languages, including Jewish Neo-Aramaic, and deciphering Judeo-Persian manuscripts and interviewing community members about their stories. He also dabbles in traditional music, cooking, and liturgy, and teaches history and Jewish heritage at various levels, and seeks to teach the world about the underrepresented cultures of the Middle East through his writing and films. And if you haven't yet seen the two short films that he created for this project, I, I uh, recommend that. They're available on the Jewish Language Project's YouTube channel. And today, Alan is going to be talking about some research that he has done on the Tehran Jewish dialect of Jewish Persian. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, that last one was very cool, as I, I do love Persian Jewish manuscripts. So that was very interesting for me. Um, I'm very excited to talk about the subject today. Um, this is, I'm going to talk about something called Sara Chali, which is the, uh, it's the, the Persian Jewish dialect of Tehran. Um, I'm very excited to talk about this because it's actually never been studied before. Uh, generally, this language is, is referred to as just an accent or as a degraded form of Persian. And a lot of the, a lot of the literature actually writes about it as, as, Basically, they say that, that there is no such a thing as a Jewish dialect of Persian. The Jews of Iran maybe spoke Judeo-Median languages and Jewish Neo-Aramaic and even Lotra'i, which is a kind of secret language. It's like a code language spoken in the bazaars in Iran. And people say that Jew, Jews in Iran, when they spoke Persian, didn't speak it any differently than the non-Jews. And um, I actually aim to disprove that from what I've seen, from what I've learned the Jews that speak Persian in Iran actually speak a very distinct dialect of Persian that is pretty different. So I'm gonna talk about that today. So uh, I have a PowerPoint here. And okay. Um, so this is, this is, I'm calling it Sarachali. Sarachal was the neighborhood in Tehran that the Jews lived in. It's also called Udlajan, but the, the Jewish name for it is, is Sarachal, uh, which means by the pit. It's kind of like where the, it was a garbage pit in like not a nice neighborhood of, Iran, of Tehran where the Jews lived. And the other name for it is Judi, which is a term used with caution. Um, people will call it Judi, but Jude is the, Jude or Jehud is the derogatory word for Jews used in Iran. So you know, Jews call each other that, maybe Jews will use that term, but 
don't really like it when non-Jews use that term. So what is Sarachali? So it's a, it's a dialect or sociolect of Persian. It developed in the 19th century, so in the 1800s, when Jews started to move to Tehran from other regions. So everyone will talk about how their parents or grandparents are from Tehran. It turns out that most people actually aren't from Tehran. They're, you know, you go a couple generations further than that and they came from other places. As I mentioned there, it's named after Sarachal and it's the, uh, the derogatory term for Jews. So uh, is Judy. So this language kind of has a very low prestige. It's looked down upon, it's used in jokes and it's not generally thought of as a language. It's thought of as incorrect Persian. So, uh, Tehran, it's important to remember, was actually a, a pretty like insignificant village throughout most of Iranian history, while all these other regions were, were very important. Um, Tehran wasn't really. It was actually kind of a village outside of the city of Ray, which was more important at the time. Ray is now just kind of like a suburb or a neighborhood of Tehran because it's expanded so much. And it was really only in the 17 and 1800s that Tehran started to really become a big city of its own and Jews from all over the country started to move there. So if you see this map, there, these are places where Jews lived and Jews eat, spoke their own languages on all of these places. And some of them even spoke multiple languages, like I mentioned. So in Kashan, for example, they spoke Judeo-Kashani. They spoke Persian also with the Muslims and they spoke Lotrai, which was the coded language in the bazaars. And people from all over the country all came to Tehran, all brought multiple languages with them. And all of these languages kind of smashed together in Sarachal and became a version of Persian, like it's definitely standard Persian, but it became a version of that that is very specific to the Jews. And uh, so for example, I, in my family, three out of my four grandparents were born in Tehran. But if you go to their grandparents, we end up with like six different regions that are all on this map and six different languages that they all probably brought with them to Tehran when they moved and they all smashed together. So as I said, Sarachali, it's a form of Persian. It's, it is kind of on a spectrum. So it, it could be an accent. You can look at it as an accent, of just like a very specific way that people speak to a whole language that is unintelligible to non-Jewish Persian speakers. Uh, that being said, it's still more intelligible to standard Persian speakers than Judeo-Median languages or Jude Jewish Neo-Aramaic. Um, so a parallel from that, from that that I would use from the same era in the United States is Yiddish versus Jewish English. The Jews that were moving to the United States, let's say in New York, they might speak Yiddish and English speakers in New York wouldn't understand their Yiddish at all. But if they spoke Jewish English, they'd probably mostly understand it, but they wouldn't they'd miss a few words that are in Hebrew or like they'd see it as an accent or something like that. But Jewish English is a real thing, as is Sarachali. Um, so here's some of the features of Sarachali. This is information I've gathered pretty recently. Uh, it's not necessarily uniform among speakers. People might have had grandparents from different cities, so their version of the language might be a little different. Uh, this language follows the rules of colloquial Tehrani. So it's, it, is not as much like the formal Persian, it's more like the way general Tehranis speak. So for example, Tehrani, you'd say Tehruni, not Tehrani. This language has a very distinct musicality to it. So that's kind of hard to write about, but it's it's the way that people speak has, a, has certain cadences that are very, sound very Jewish. And it's often mocked in jokes about Jews. Um, you know, the, they'll, they'll speak this way, they'll do, a, they'll do a voice, they'll do a, a musicality to it that kind of suggests that the person speaking this is speaking Judy or Sarachali. Their phonological changes, the A sound becomes E, so things like Chodem, which means myself, in this dialect would be Chodem, so Chodem. Uh, the ST consonant cluster becomes just a long S, and the O sound often becomes a, an U sound, so an example would be the word shostem, which is I washed, is often pronounced as shusem. So shostem becomes shusem. Consonants fall, consonants change. Uh, mitunem, which means I can, becomes midunem, which in standard Persian means I know. But in Sarachali, if you listen closely, people will say uh, like midunem, I, I, I can. 
And then some people do overcorrections in the opposite direction. They'll, they'll speak uh, in a way when they don't want to sound Judy, they'll speak in a way that is actually incorrect standard Persian that, that is them trying to overcorrect and sound less Judy. So uh, I have examples of that too. So here's a, here's a sentence that um, it basically is, the, the bolded is in Sarachali, then the next line is in standard Persian, and then uh, English after that. This is kind of a version of Sarachali that is mainly an accent difference. These are, this will highlight some of the phonological differences. And if you look closely to the comparisons, you'll see it's not that different from the standard Persian. Generally, it's pretty similar. And I think a non-Jew who heard this would understand pretty much what it says, but would, would see that there is an accent and there, there are some differences. So I'll read it out to you. In Sarachali, it would go like this. In Shamero Amesha Chodam Tanoi Doros Tanoi. Hishkibem Nabu, Das Tano, as Sobta La Jun Kandam, Kochtam, Chidam of Achidam, O Hodam of Koshtam of Shusam, Iham of Jaru of Hamechi, O Heresham Miga Matik Zadi, O Herevas, whom ni beg a dasset than Nakone. So, any Persian speakers who are on this call, uh, I imagine, might be laughing to themselves right now because this is usually used in a joking context. This is, uh, it's not taken seriously as a dialect. It's like, Somebody would hear that and, and laugh like, huh, like that sounds so Judy. And that's kind of, you know, it's used in jokes now. Um, there are also some features of Sanicelli that are actually kind of deeper and, and more uh, vocabulary related. So there are a lot of loan words from Hebrew, Aramaic, Judeo-Median, Latrai, and archaic Persian. Examples of that kisasisit is the bag that you keep your talit in. It's called the Kisasi seat. So that's actually Persian and Hebrew together. There's a phrase, Lashun Bara, which is Aramaic and also kind of Lotrai and means like don't speak. There's Lube Meshtan, which is Lotrai. That's the, the coded language of the bazaars. And it also means don't, it's like don't speak in front of somebody. And then Adine is a kind of archaic Persian word that's also used in Judeo Median and it means Friday. But in this dialect, it means the night before something. So you would say Adina Rosh Hashanah to mean the night before Rosh Hashanah. And uh, there are Persian words and phrases that are used in different, uh, very culturally specific ways. Uh, there are new compounded verbs created by smashing together Hebrew words with Persian verbs. So here's some examples. There's Mila Konun, which is a Brit Mila. Mila means Mila from Hebrew. And then Konun is uh, the verb for doing. And so, my life growing up, I always knew a brit mila as a mila kunu. Another one is tanit gereftan. Tanit is Hebrew for fasting, and gereftan is the Persian word for getting or observing. So tanit gereftan means you are fasting. Growing up, I never knew that that was that tanit was a Hebrew word. I actually just thought it was Farsi. And so I remember speaking to my friend growing up who was a, a Muslim Persian, and I asked him, like, Shoma Ramazun. Tanit begin, do you also fast on Ramadan? And he didn't know what Tanit Gereftan meant. He, that wasn't a thing to him. Um, Shatar Neveshtan is another one. Shatar is the Hebrew word. Neveshtan is Persian, meaning writing. And this is the word for like signing a ketubah. And there are also grammatical shifts that are unusual to standard Persian. So I'm going to show you another example of Sarachali. And this is going to be a little bit more, this is a sentence I constructed, which is admittedly, I really laid on the, the loan words thick. It might be kind of rare to hear a sentence quite this uh, vocabulary different, but I think it'll, it'll show that somebody who is listening to this who doesn't speak a Jewish dialect might actually not understand what somebody is saying when they're speaking Sarachali. So here's an example, um, and it goes like this. Becher. گفتش که آدینه یک شبات بعد تفیلا هخامه یاین میخورد آونه بلا یه سوره شوته وز ازش سر علیلا داره هتاتی پاشتی خوب بود هادوری کخ سر کنه تو را در میون به جاش مورشون مورده به یارون گویمه میگه پر پر بزنی گال تا so if somebody, if you, if you look closely between the comparisons in this sentence uh, you'll see they're quite different uh, this has a lot of loan words from all the different sources that I mentioned um, and here, yeah, the, I think this demonstrates kind of the, the 
the level of difference that this dialect can have. It, it really is not just an accent. It really is uh, a dialect. It's a, it's a, a real way that people speak and it's a real uh, unique way that people speak. So here's some of the challenges of studying this and trying to gather data in this is that it has such a low prestige that especially after Jews were able to leave Sayachov that it, it became looked down upon to speak this way, um, as did a lot of the other regional languages that the Jews spoke. So often, so if I, if I used one of these features that I mentioned when I'm speaking to any Jewish Persian speaker, if I casually use that in speech, they might say, which means now that's too Jewy. Like, you know, you're speaking in this weird way. They, most people speak standard Persian instead. Uh, there's no literature really on this topic and people claim that there's no Jewish dialect of Persian, which as I demonstrated is not true. And uh, even recently somebody told me, oh, I know like, like a non-Jewish Persian told me, yeah, I know Jews and our Persian is not, is not any different from each other. And I, I mentioned like probably they're code switching um, to standard Persian. And a lot of people who will use certain phrases among, among Jews, but they won't use them when they're speaking to Muslim Persians. Everyone knows how to speak standard Persian as well and will we'll kind of move between different levels of formality. So another parallel with the United States that I could use is with African-American vernacular English that outside of linguists and activists, it's not really seen as a, as a viable language or dialect. It's just seen as incorrect English, but it does follow rules. It has linguistic features on every level that are, that are different and unique to it. And it really is a dialect of its own, but it's instead of because of kind of like social class reasons, it's just seen as such a lower prestige thing. People don't want to speak in it. They don't want to be seen speaking in it. So if I try to interview someone in this and, and they know that I'm trying to interview their Judy speaking or their Sarachali speaking, they just won't speak in that. They'll speak in standard Persian instead. There's no associated regional pride. So it's not like somebody who's from Sanandaj and they're proud that they're from Sanandaj and they want to preserve their Jewish Aramaic language. It's, it's just Tehruni Persian to most people. They don't see it as a separate thing. Uh, and it has close contact with the, uh, the standard dialect. Everyone who speaks Sarachali also speaks Farsi. So it's very easy for this language to disappear and, uh, and be gone. So uh, this is a picture of my grandfather and my great-grandmother in uh, their house, I think, in Sarachal. And uh, so I'll just finish with this. It, today, Sarachali is not really spoken by most young Persian Jews, uh, most Persian Jews. Uh, speak standard Persian with maybe a few Jewish specific features. Maybe they'll say the word tanit for fasting, uh, things like that. But they, it's a, a lot of it has has disappeared. It's definitely stronger among older speakers who still even so code switch when speaking to non-Jews or to non-family members. So even though I'm Jewish, I'll show up and I'll if I try to talk to them, they usually won't talk to me in that way. They'll talk to me in standard Persian. Uh, and yeah, these Jewish dialects disappear even faster than standard Persian does outside the U.S. because they're so specific to one community. It's a socialect, so uh, it's only now even being identified as a valid dialect or form of speech, and that's kind of just by me um, and some of the people who have been supporting me. So um, despite this lack of prestige, I think that Sarachali is very important and specific. It's interesting and it's historically significant. Uh, and it tells us a lot about the different communities in Iran as they all came together in Tehran and as they started to blend together. So hopefully it can be continually seen as a more valid form of speech and not just as incorrect Persian and not just as a joke to, to laugh at. Uh, and, you know, hopefully this way of speaking can also be preserved for generations to come. Wow, Alan, this is just amazing. And again, I hope you publish this soon also because this is really important work. And I, I really liked your connections, your analogies with African-American English and Jewish English. And there is a lot of talk about, are these valid ways of speaking? And one of our goals at the Jewish Language Project is to 
share that any way of speaking is valid. If people speak that way, then it's grammatical according to their own way of speaking. Um, and so much of what we talk about regarding language is the standard, but there's so many other ways of speaking and you've just shed light on a, a distinctive Jewish way of speaking that it seems like it's not so common today. Uh, it's more of a historical phenomenon, just like the uh, letters that, that uh, that Ibrahim and Dr. Borgian shared earlier. So thank you for that. Now I'd like to introduce our final panelist and then there will be some time for Q&A at the end. Um, Jacqueline Rafi'i is the cantor at Shomrei Torah Synagogue in West Hills, California. She was ordained as a chazan and earned her master's in sacred Jewish music from the Academy for Jewish Religion in California. For her master's thesis, Jackie conducted original fieldwork in the area of preserving, notating, and disseminating Persian Jewish prayer melodies. Prior to becoming a cantor, Jackie practiced entertainment law. She also served as the first ever female prayer leader at the Iranian Jewish Senior Center's High Holy Days Services. Cantor Rafi is a composer and pianist and performs Jewish music in Hebrew, Ladino, Farsi, and English. And today she's gonna share with us something special from her family's history that's relevant to our topic for the day. Thank you so much, um, Drs. Benor and Pressman for um, inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for the Jewish Language Project and for um, preserving this heritage. As you mentioned, um, I also embarked on a preservation project for my master's thesis um, in becoming ordained as a cantor, and I uh, hunted down melodies from Iran um, over the last century um, or older and notated them. Notation is a way to um, preserve melodies. And though it's not perfect because when you notate a melody, you're basically fossilizing one iteration of that melody, it is still a way to preserve something. Um, and for centuries, music um, has been transmitted orally and each performance and each person who inherits a melody does it slightly differently um, and though that ornamentation is special in itself um, but as with every preservation project um, a little bit of that improvisation might be lost when you write something down but i think the trade-off is that for generations to come um, you have something um, that uh, you know concrete so um, this was a really meaningful project for me um, and all of these melodies were in Hebrew um, with, um, I'm sorry, all of these prayers were in Hebrew, but the melodies were Persian. However, there was one very special um, prayer. It was Psalms 113 and 114, which my grandfather of blessed memory, Yehuda Rafi, my father's father, um, actually translated himself from the Hebrew into Persian, into standard Persian. Um, Alan just spoke, you know, beautifully about um, th these different dialects, and all the panelists spoke about these different dialects. Um, he, my grandfather, and all of my grandparents were from Hamadan originally, but moved to Tehran um, as you know, and and kind of embarked on this process of secularization and adopting standard Persian. So what he did was um, he had a Haggadah, which which is the um, book that we read from on Passover and it was in, in Hebrew only and on the spot he would translate into Persian um, those prayers and these Psalms. So what I will do is um, share with you first for a moment um, his a little bit of um, a little bit of background and then I'll share with you the recording and I'll also sing a little bit. So here is Here's my grandfather um, of blessed memory. Um, he, and this, um, I, I will share the music in just a moment, but this is a Persian translation. Um, and thanks to my dad, Hamid Rafi, his son, um, who actually wrote this out with the Persian script. And this is the English translation. So um, here is the melody that I will share with you. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Abide Adonai, Hallelujah, the Shem Adonai. Mahigu Yit Hodoro, 
Okay, so that, um, let me stop the share here. So this was um, discovered, um, my dad has these cassette tapes of my grandfather's voice and, um, you know, he brought these over from Tehran when, um, you know, there was this mass, ex mass exodus. Um, in the 1970s. And so my dad brought this tape over and I listened to this tape with him and we um, um, embarked on this project not of notation. I'm also going to show you um, what the notation looks like just so you can see what this project is about. So here's a notation and uh, I took a process, it's called contrafaction, where you take a melody and you apply it to different words. So my grandfather had this melody, um, probably from Hamadan, this melody, and and used it for a uh, Persian um, text and I used contrafaction and applied it to the Hebrew text of Psalm 113. And also to give some background, Psalms 113 and Psalms 114 are part of Passover. They're part of Hallel, which is um, recited during Jewish festivals, and they're also part of the Passover Seder. So in the Hebrew, this would be Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Dei Adonai, Hallelujah, et Shem Adonai, Yehi Shem Adonai, Mevorach, Meata ve Adolam, Mi Mizrach Shemesh, Had Mevo, Mehulal Shem Adonai, etc. So I'll just conclude by saying that, um, my, my father and his siblings, who I interviewed for this project, um, they noted that my grandfather's translation of the Hebrew prayers was what connected them to Judaism. Because while my grandfather and the generations before, um, they had a lot of Jewish education and there was a, a lot more religiosity in those previous generations with secularization and the move to Tehran, a lot of that um, changed. And so my father and his siblings didn't really have a formal Jewish education, but my grandfather's um, translation of these into Persian and of the Hebrew prayers into Persian was a way that they were able to understand the prayers and connect to their Jewish heritage. And it was a formative part of their Jewish heritage. And it has been a formative part of my connection to my Persian Jewish heritage as well. So for that, I'm very grateful to my grandfather. So thank you very much for having me. Wow, that was just beautiful. And what a wonderful uh, family connection there that you're 
grandfather sang and wrote these these beautiful psalms and that you are able to to use them as well in your own personal religious practice and to share them with others and it's really reflective of the language shift because um, throughout history Jews have translated prayers and biblical texts into their vernacular so that they could better understand them and and so that they would be a more personal part of their Jewish observance and your grandfather did that and now you are translating them not translating them but you're singing them in Hebrew and and um, because Hebrew is such an important part of uh, Jewish observance among American Jews as it has been throughout history so thank you very much for sharing that Hannah. Oh, I'm now going to introduce our Director of Education and Engagement, Hannah Pressman, to um, close us out. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Benor. On behalf of the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for attending today's presentations. Big, big thank you to our series sponsors for making the whole Languages of the Jews of Iran series possible the Iranian American Jewish Federation, Nessa Synagogue, and USC Kazan Institute. Additionally, a big thank you to all of our series co-sponsors. 30 years after, American Jewish Committee, American Sephardi Federation, ASF Institute of Jewish Experience, B'chol Lashon, Endangered Language Alliance, Iranian Jewish Women's Organization, Jemena, Shai Sephardic Heritage Alliance, Inc., UCLA Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, and YNS Nazarian Iranian Young Leadership Initiative of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. And lastly, thank you again to all of the panelists for today's fascinating discussion. Hundreds of people around the world have attended each of the events in our Languages of the Jews of Iran series. Whether today is the first event you attended or whether you attended all four, we hope that you'll consider supporting our efforts to preserve Iranian Jewish languages. Under Professor Benor's leadership, the Jewish Language Project has built a network of partner organizations, researchers, and volunteers who are working tirelessly to document Iranian Jewish languages. However, we're only about 30% of the way towards our goal of raising the funds required to record 20 more speakers and create resources that will be accessible to the public now and for future generations. If you'd like to support our efforts, please visit the Give Campus link that Professor Benor is dropping in the chat. The fundraiser runs for two more weeks and we really appreciate your support. I wanna quickly highlight two events on our spring calendar. On May 15th, we'll be co-sponsoring an event about queer Jewish languages. And on May 25th, we're showcasing multilingual Jewish prayer throughout history. For more details and registration for all of our upcoming events, please visit our website at jewishlanguages.org slash events. While you're there, you can sign up for our mailing list and access many online exhibits, articles, and videos of past events. You can also check out our social media feeds, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for fun facts, content from our partners, buzzworthy language news, event reminders, and more. Here at the Jewish Language Project, we believe that there is a world of history in every Jewish language, and each speaker and each document has something to teach us, which I think today's panel definitely demonstrated. Thank you again for joining us for today's program. To all those who will be celebrating Purim this week and Passover next month, Chag Sameach. Take care and have a wonderful week.